<laughs> All right, hi everyone. Hi. Oh man, it's good to be back. All right, everyone, settle down, settle down. You had, you had your spring break early. So, thank you, everyone. Um, I really appreciate your patience with the last class. I, I'll tell you actually what happened. Um, at one point, there was some really bad feedback, and I tried muting the class. And what I didn't realize was I couldn't unmute you. So some of that actually come to the podium and manually unmute you. That's why I couldn't hear you. But I'm very grateful that you indulged me. And I think the class actually wasn't as bad as it could have been. But I think we actually did decent, because I'm not a big fan of lecturing, and you can probably see why. I don't like talking that much. Uh, but I thank you all. Also, thank you for your patience and letting me cancel class. Uh, explained in the syllabus, we will have um, makeups not required that we're recorded. We can set those times another time. Um, and on a personal note, it's really good to be back. Um, I, I don't know if professors tell you, but we actually do love our jobs. We, we really do, and we love teaching. And uh, even being out of the classroom for like two weeks, it, it, you miss it because it's something that you enjoy doing every day. Um, and I was all over the place and a lot of fun. I, I probably spoke to probably like almost 500 people in the past two weeks in various law schools across the country. Um, which I see is an extension of teaching, so I'm just giving many constitutional lectures. But it was a lot of fun. Uh, the book tour was good. I had a lot of good reviews, a lot of good media, uh, selling a lot of books, and I'm uh, very happy. But uh, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to be back. So thank you very much. All right, anyone have any questions? Something lingering thought? Yes? Anything that's on your mind? Anything. All right, and I, I, will, I will work in a mini review of the acquisition by find in today's lecture at an appropriate time. Not not the beginning, but in a few minutes, OK? So I, I promise I will, I will do a mini lecture that's actually germane and reviews it. Anything else? Anything on your minds? Everyone good? Who won in Rice versus U of H? I didn't even see the score. I knew they were playing. <laughs> Wait, who won? Was it, was it close? All right, and did the Texans win? I didn't even, I didn't even check. No. Cowboys won. I was actually, I was actually in a plane last night, like at like a, a really late. So I actually watched Monday Night Football on, on the plane. It's a pretty good game, also. Let's see. Uh, did anyone see that the Astros game last year had a zero point share on the Nielsen ratings? Not a single Nielsen family in all of Houston was actually watching the game. And actually, the uh, the Yankees are in town this week. I was thinking about getting tickets, but at this point, the season's over, so I'm not gonna bother. All right. Any uh, any other thoughts? All right. Today we are in the last topic of possession, right? Relish it, because next class it gets really boring. Uh, not boring, but not intuitive. Everything we've done so far has been intuitive. You know, hunting, uh, uh, finding stuff that's been lost, um, giving gifts, uh, killing people in caves because you can't, you don't have enough food. I mean, this is stuff that that comes to you naturally. The stuff we do next week goes futile. It's, you're still waking up. It's okay. The, 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 the next class goes futile. We start talking about how... What's that? <laughs> there it is. Sometimes there's a delayed reaction. In the next class, we talk about feudalism and how the feudal people structure property rights. Today, we'll do the last topic. So we've all given gifts. And we've probably never thought much about it, but there's actually a, a big legal doctrine. Why is it important for there to be a doctrine about whether a gift is actually given or not. Um, I'm just going to start in the back corner because I have to no idea. Is that Morton? I'm sorry? Yes. Why is it important for the law to have a doctrine to determine whether or not someone gave a valid gift? I mean, what, what's the potential for abuse? Uh, louder, please? Well, well let, me, let me ask this question. Say, you know, we did last week, just review. Remember we talked about bailment, right? Where you can give someone an object for a temporary purpose. Like you give your clothes to the laundromat, you give your keys to the valet parker, right? When you give your keys to the guy at the valet, do you expect him to keep your car? Right. What, what do you expect when you give him the keys with... Right. Gifts is very specific. When you give something, you have a certain intent, right? When I give the keys to the valet guy, I expect him to wash my car for whatever amount of time at a restaurant. And then when I come back, he gives me my keys. This isn't like Ferris Bueller where you know, he takes a joyride. Okay? The key thing about gifts is what's the intent. 
do you intend the person to just have a bailment, that is to hold it for some temporary purpose, or do you intend for the person to keep it permanently? That's the nature of a gift. The gift is permanent. It can't be revoked. So, um, uh, uh, Mat Matthias, so if I give a gift, right, I give them a gift, and I say, I want you to have this forever, and I, I give it to them. And then the next day I say, yeah, never mind, I don't want it. Give it back to me. And the guy gives it back to me. Who owns it? Yeah, I, I give you a present. I say, it's yours forever. And the next day I say, never mind, I don't want it anymore. And I say, give it back to me, and you're a nice guy, so you hand it back to me. You, yes, you get to keep it. Gifts are irrevocable, right? No backsies right? when little kids. When you give a gift, it's permanent. And merely asking, can I have it back, is not enough to negate that. It's actually a way of giving a property right. Okay? Everyone okay with that? Just, I mean, this is what we all learned when we were little kids. If someone gives you a present, you can't ask for it back, right? Let's do, let's do some terminology first. And I'm going to beat this dead horse, uh, dead horse over and over again. Whenever you look at these terms, grantor, grantee, donor, donee, uh, donee even extra mortgagor, mortgagee, you always look at the last two letters. Um, is it Andrew? Okay, so donor and donee. Who's a donor? Who's a donee? And how do we know this? What's, what's the little device we use? Louder, please? Yes, because right, me giving it to me. I, I know it's not stupid, but you'll remember this. The donor is a person giving the gift. The donee is receiving the gift. This is, we've done this in, with, I think, eight or nine other prefixes. Okay? And uh, Adam, what are, what are the requirements for a gift? There are a couple requirements that have to be present. Okay. Okay, so say it again, please. Okay, so intent. Okay. Okay, delivery. Okay. What's the last one? Acceptance. Okay. The most important one, usually, is the first one. Am I giving you something temporarily? If it's temporary, it's a bailment. It's permanent to give, right? Second factor, is there actually delivery? This one proves difficult, because often the thing you're given can't be physically delivered. So we do the case in a few minutes with all the furniture. You obviously can't hand someone a dresser because it's too heavy. Or you can't hand someone, you know, uh, uh, something that's, that's maybe locked, so you hand them a key. We'll talk about that in a bit. The third one, acceptance, is usually not a factor. Why? Because if a person doesn't accept the gift and they refuse it, then too bad, right? They'll never make the court. If I give you a gift and you say, nah, I don't want it, that's usually the end of the story. The only reason why these cases end up in court was someone accepted the gift and then something bad happened. Maybe they weren't clear with what they were specifying, or maybe the intent wasn't clear, or maybe, uh, may maybe there wasn't delivery. But the acceptance one is usually a, a given, so don't worry too much about that one. Okay? Okay. So historically, the easiest type of delivery was physical. The act of actually transferring it from one hand to the other. Um, is that Stuart? Okay. Uh, Patrick? Patrick, why is physical delivery such an easy method of delivery that that, that court really like? Why, what's, so, what's so good about the physical delivery? Mm -hmm. Right, it's clear. If I come up and I give you this bottle of water, say, here, this is a present. Here's a tangible act. Everyone can see that I'm handing you this bottle of water. There's no question. Am I referring to the, you know, the entire piece of water? Or maybe I'm referring to just a cup of the water. I'm giving you the bottle. Okay. But unfortunately, most of the questions you'll consider in this class and on the exam will not be physical delivery. They'll be uh, one of the other two types. So there's two phrases, constructive delivery and symbolic delivery. Um, and they're, they're kind of related, but, but kind of not. Um, Aaron, can you walk through the differences between the constructive delivery and the symbolic delivery? Okay. Well, uh, start again. What's constructive delivery? Tell me what's constructive delivery.
So if you ever see like, um, you know, they always air these around Christmas, right? These commercials for Lexus. And, you know, and the mom wakes up, she's still sleepy, and the husband gives her like a, a pair of keys, right? And she goes outside, there's a nice Lexus with like a bow on top of it, right? Everyone knows those commercials? Right. He's not physically handing her the car, right? That would probably kill her. He's giving her... <laughs> he's giving her something to represent. Yes, he would, if he dropped the car, and it would kill her. He's giving her something to represent it. Giving someone a pair of keys <laughs> for a, uh, a, a gift is what we call constructive. So we can remember that like the keys. Um, Lee? Where else have you seen the word constructive in any of the other classes that you've had so far in law school? They have one semester down, so I mean, not, not too many places to look. But where have you seen the word constructive? Yeah. What's that? In what context? Good, good. Okay, that was one I was thinking, but that works. So, <laughs> perfect. So, what's the difference between actual constructive knowledge? So, do we know for a fact that they actually do with constructive knowledge? But is a court willing to assume they do? Okay. Similar here. So I was actually thinking of constructive service. Remember from CIPRO? You cited that? When you can't perform a physical service of... Well, you blocked it out. <laughs> Remember what service of process is? Remember you have to notify someone that you're suing them? There's all these rules you have to follow? So generally... Yeah, you've got that. So... There are certain rules you have to follow to serve one process, but in case you can't do all the rules, you might do something similar to like you might be able to mail it to them or give it to an intermediary. We call this constructive process. Even if it didn't actually happen, the court will soon happen. So it's very similar with gifts. You have physical delivery, that's where the guy actually transfers it. Then you have constructive, where the person did physically transfer it. He did some act that's representative of it. For example, like an Alexis commercial, giving the, the keys to his wife on Christmas morning rather than dropping a you know, a 6,000 pound uh, SUV on her, right? Who's your boss? Yes, ma'am. I guess you've got the one that's very similar. It doesn't have to, it doesn't have to actually grant access to, but it often does. It's meant to, and I'm going to use the wrong word. I'm using the word symbolize, mm -hmm. right? But that's the wrong word. But it's meant to symbolize the gift. The symbol re represents another good word. Um, so we can use maybe symbolize, represent. Um, it represents the gift. It's not the actual gift, but it represents the gift. For example, in, in the case of like the wardrobe, right? Really, if so someone wants to give someone the contents and the inside of a wardrobe, handing the key would probably be a good thing. The case we're going to read it has been subject to dispute. It's not clear. Yes, sir. Not, not exactly. Because symbolic is more likely some sort of a, a written instrument. This is more of like, instead of, you know, dear old husband giving the keys on Christmas morning, he hands her the title. Right? Like, here, honey. Here's a title for a car. It's not quite as romantic, but um, it's more. It's it's generally used to refer to written instruments. The difference between them is very subtle, and really now the difference actually is mostly eroded because courts. There used to be all these different rules where if it's symbolic, constructive, you need to have more evidence or not. And in the modern era, most of those rules have just broken apart because most of the things that we give now are not physical. We give things mostly symbolic. So if I send you an email saying, "Hey," Uh, you can have, you know, that that you know, that refrigerator in my apartment. That would be a good evidence of the gift. I don't have to actually hand over the refrigerator. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, let's see. Do I have anything else in my notes? I'm sorry. What do you mean? I don't know. Is that in the context of gifts? 
I mean, the, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure about that. that. That might be right. Well, hopefully get some oral instructions about how to find like, like a treasure map. Yeah. A treasure map can be constructed delivery. It'd be a very confusing aspect that might be written. Don't don't get too bogged down the difference. Really, it, it, I, I'm not. It's not that big of a deal in the modern era. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Even saddle. Yeah, I mean, I mean. Yeah, I mean, example is going to give is say someone gave you like a, a book full of sheet music for the piano. The actual gift was the piano, right? That might be a good constructive gift. Or, or the example she, she mentioned, you give someone a saddle because you can't actually give the horse. That might be another example. But don't get too bogged down because for purposes of our studies, it really does make a difference. Yes, sir. Uh, you know, I'm not sure. Um, if, it's, if it's a close enough match, it's probably going to be good enough. The reason why the case we're going to do in a few minutes, the uh, we'll, we'll do the problems first, but the case we're going to do with the uh, the wardrobe is so tricky, was we don't know what his actual intent was. That there were multiple ways to interpret it. So when I point to a wardrobe, I might actually mean the physical furniture, or I might mean the insurance policy inside of it. When I talk about the keys, I might just mean, oh, so that, that way you can open and close the wardrobe. Or it might mean you can extract the contents. So one of the reasons why we have the statute of wills, and you'll say this next class, is to make sure that a person's wishes are enforced. The person's dead, right? They can't come back and tell us what they wanted. That's why there are a lot of formalities. You need to have two witnesses. You need to have it written in a very clear way. That way, after the person is dead, we can be very certain about what they intended. In this case, the guy's dead. He can't tell us what he wanted. So we have to infer from the uh, actions of a person who couldn't really speak, who was just kind of, you know, waving his finger and pointing at something, handing keys. It's not abundantly clear. And I might add that the, the main person who witnessed this was the person who stands to inherit all the money. So she has definitely a, some, something of a conflict of interest in, in interpreting it. That's why the statute of wills is so important. And that's why the court, especially in the second case, is more, is more tight about it. Okay? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so I, if, I, if I can restate your question slightly differently, I think her question was, so say someone um, leaves, you know, say, say I leave in my will something to you, right? And then I croak. And then you, you gift the same thing to someone else. Is that right? No, no, no. Let's just say it again, then. So right before some guy dies... Sorry, so right before I die, use me. It makes it easier. Okay, right before you die, you're like, hey, <laughs> I want to give you this armoire. And I give it to you. And you give it to me. Right. But in your will, you say, this armoire, this armoire... Okay, okay, now I get your question. The will doesn't matter till I die, right? So if I give something away before I die, that's the time that I die, my will can't give it away. Your will can only give away what's in your estate, Right? I think we actually do a question like this maybe next semester, but, but there, there's a case like this. Um, I can write in my will that I'm going to leave you the Mona Lisa, right? When I die, I don't have it, so you can't get it. The only thing that's distributed from my state is stuff I actually have. Okay. Let's take a look at um, problem one. It's on page 166, please. And um, Hunter, uh, take a second to read it on page 166. And this, and this question uh, kind of highlights the uh, difference between the bailment, leaving something behind, or giving something to someone temporarily and permanently. Okay, so so can you please read the question, please? Just the first, just the first a few sentences. Okay, so we have a case where O owns a ring, it's hers, and she actually leaves it by a sink. I mean, uh, we, we've done this all the time. And the daughter calls her and says, hey, hey, mom, uh, you left this ring here. And then the mom says, oh, you can keep it as a gift. Okay? So, 
Hunter, what do you think? Is there has there been a valid gift here? Well, okay, let, let, let's walk through them. Okay, so there, there are three factors, right? So what's the first factor? Was there intention to give? That's not what I asked. Was, was there an intention to give? Yes, later. What's interesting about these cases is even if the intent comes up later, it kind of goes back. The intent doesn't have to be made in advance. Right? Okay, so one, so the, was there intent? Okay, yeah. So what, what's the second element? Okay, was there delivery? Yeah, there was physical delivery. Again, even though initially she left it there accidentally, her later statement kind of ratified it. Her later statement made it okay. Because imagine the alternative. Do we really want to require the mother to take the ring back and then give it to her again? Right? That's silly. The mom said, yeah, daughter, you can have it. If we want to be really formalistic, we would make the daughter give it back to the mom, the mom gives it back to the daughter. That's a waste of time. The law effectively sees that once the first element satisfied, there was intent, and there was some kind of delivery, it's okay. And did the daughter accept it? Yeah. So all three elements are meant. So was there a valid gift? Who owns, who owns the ring here? Daughter. Everyone see that? Yes, ma'am. Within reason, yeah. Everyone see that? All three elements are present. Don't get don't get messed up by how the facts lay out. It, in your head, in an exam, just go through three elements. If the three elements are present, then it's it's, it's more likely than not going to be okay. Okay. Take a look at um, the, Matt. Take a look at the the second paragraph, please, in in the first question. Okay, and when you can, please read it. Just the uh, second paragraph. Okay. So unfortunately in this class, everyone dies. Um, my, my exams are very bloody because people have to die for property to move. It's very unfortunate. But people always die in very tragic, sudden ways, usually shortly after they make a conveyance of property. Okay, so the facts are slightly different. Um, at, at dinner, he says, Mom, you forgot this ring. And then the mom says, Oh, sweetie, I want you to have it. It's yours. Right? So at that moment, Matt, when she says, you know, Sweetie, I want you to have it. It's yours. Was there a valid gift? Just at that point. Stop at that time. The mom says, uh, quote, there was intent. Was there delivery? No, no. The daughter found the ring in the sink, right? The daughter has in her hand, and she goes, hey, mom, you left this ring here. And the mom goes, I want you to have it. At that point, was there a valid gift? Yes. Everyone see that? He goes through his delivery. The mom left the bottom of the sink. There was intent because the mom says, oh, sweetie, I want you to have this ring. And the daughter accepted it. Okay? Then we go to the next sentence. The daughter, without handing it back, the mom tries it on and says, oh, it doesn't fit. Right? It doesn't fit. The mom says, let me wear it until I can get it cut down and fit for you. Right? So then the daughter gives it back to the mom. Matt, when the daughter gives it back to the mom, what's the daughter's intent? What do we call that? We said this last time. What's that, what's that word? Dailment, right? Dailment. Same way when they give the laundry guy my clothes or I give a valet guy my keys. The daughter gave it to the mom for the limited purpose of holding it until it was resized. This wasn't a gift. 
This was just hold it temporarily. Okay? Everyone see that? All right, so, so Jerry? Okay, so then we go to the next sentence. Okay, so the mom leaves the restaurant wearing the ring, and she's killed by a car. Okay? And then A sues the executor. The executor is a person who manages an estate. Uh, just That's a stand-in title. So who wins here? Does the daughter win, or does the uh, mom's estate win? Yes, second paragraph. Why? Explain. Yes, she was a she was a bailey. She only had it temporarily. Okay, the daughter gave it to the mom for a la for a narrow purpose to hold it while being resigned, wherever many days or weeks it happened to be. It was narrow. The daughter retained the possession subject to that bailment. Okay. So be very careful when you look at these questions about what type of intent is there. Is there an intent to give it temporarily, or is this a permanent gift forever and ever and ever? Yes, ma'am. No. It doesn't. And, and it's for the reason I mentioned before. It will be silly to have to require the daughter to give it back to the mom and the mom to give it back to the daughter. Well, courts have done this. Just cut that step out. They said if there was intent and there was delivery and maybe it was backwards, we'll just pretend it was a, they were concurrent. It's kind of like a, a rule that's to minimize the amount of work that has to be done. Because with a ring, it's easy enough to transfer. You can imagine something bigger, you know, real property. It's kind of a pain in the neck. Um, uh, you'll actually do cases next semester where a person gives them a piece of land and the paperwork's not good. Then they do the paperwork correct later. They treat it as if it's done correctly. They don't make the transaction occur twice because that's a lot of waste. Everyone see, see that? Okay. So, um, David, let's do the third paragraph, please. Oh, is that? No, no, no. The third, the third paragraph. That's okay. Okay. Okay, what results? Stop there. So, the, the facts are different. So instead of the mom saying, sweetie, you can have this ring now, she says, sweetie, you can have this ring when I kick the bucket, right? Is that a gift? Would that, would that gift be valid? Why do you say yes? Well, what's different between this case and the second case? What, what, when, when will the gift become effective in this paragraph? No, no. When will this gift become effective? In this class. In this class. If there's a gift that happens after death, it's not okay for this class. That's your rule of thumb. We don't do gifts that are contingent on death. Okay? So I'm going to put two words on the board, which you might have seen. Before, but I, I don't I don't know if you've seen it, so I'll define them. I, I might have given you myself, I can't remember. Inter vivos and testamentary. Anyone, what do these two words mean? Inter vivos means among the living. Not like la viva loca, but uh la viva loca, but among the living. And te what's testamentary? What's it's the opposite. Yeah. Okay, so this is a gift during life, and this is a gift during death. For this topic, we are only going to deal with inter vivos gifts. This is the thing with the New York and the guy in the painting and you know, all that stuff. Oh, I spelled this wrong, I'm sorry. Testamentary. If it's a gift that takes effect after death, it's testamentary. If the gift is testamentary, it must satisfy the statute of wills. Okay, so who here has heard of the statute of wills? Anyone? Yeah? What's the statute of wills? Right. Basically. So you all study the statute of frauds. I'm sure you hate it immensely. The close cousin of the statute of fraud is a statute of wills, right? 
What is the statute of frauds? Big deal. Something has to be in writing, right? Remember that? We, we studied this. Same thing for the statute of wills. Under the statute of wills, a, a testament must have two witnesses signed. Oops. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll drop this down to the next page. So if you want to have a valid will, there, there are like thousands of requirements, but the most basic requirement is that you have to have two witnesses who both sign it. Right? So for any gift that takes place after death, two witnesses have to sign it. David, in this case, were there two witnesses who signed this, uh, signed anything? So would this gift be inter vivos or testamentary? Why? When is the gift going to affect them? So is the gift inter vivos or testamentary? Right. I mean, obviously, we can only make promises while we're living, right? We, we can't make a promise after we're dead unless we're a zombie. So the gift goes into effect after death. So it's, what kind of gift is it? And if it's testamentary, what must it satisfy? And does this satisfy the statute of wills? No. This does not satisfy the statute of wills because there are no witnesses. I can't just go promising stuff to people after I die without having a formal will. I mean, um, is that Thomas? Why would it be a bad idea to allow people to give gifts for after they die without having witnesses? Why, why would that be a bad idea? Why? Exactly. Once I'm dead, once I'm room temperature, I can't contest stuff in court. The reason why we have these laws is to protect the dead guy. That if he wants to give a gift, and we want to honor his intent, it has to be in writing with two witnesses. And not just the people who stand to inherit it, two independent witnesses. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so we'll you'll you'll we'll do this a little bit later in property two, but generally it's something called intestate. Intestate actually comes up in the case we do next. Intested means when you die without a will, and every state has what's called an intestacy statute. I can never spell it. In I can never spell it. intestacy statute. Whatever. This statute says if you die without a will, here's who gets your money. So usually, if you're married and you have no kids, the wife pretty much gets everything. If you're married with kids, the wife gets half, and the kids get the other half. It varies by state. Um, if you have any siblings, the siblings take a certain amount. If you have parents who are alive, there's all these really complicated formulas who, who gets what. Um, and this is actually fairly worked out. You'll take a trust and estate class to go through this. So if any of you die without a will, your money will eventually go to someone. Someone gets it. It's much better for it to go to who you want it to. That's why people should have wills. I'm a hypocrite, I don't, uh, but uh, only, only the people get me a lot of student debt, so I'm not really too worried about it. All right, any other questions on this? Okay, let, let's do um, a question, the, the fourth paragraph, please. Can you please read it? Yeah, right there? Yeah, the, right here. This paragraph being supposed. Would you mind? No. Suppose I used to be a $21,000 engagement. Later, the engagement is broken. Okay, so just stop for a second. I'll call back from you. Um, it's funny, last night I was on the plane uh, uh, coming back, and there was a, a guy sitting across from Fritch, who was a lawyer, and he was reading what looked to be a divorce settlement agreement. Um, I probably shouldn't have been looking at it, but I, I was bored. And, and, it was, and, the, and these were from very wealthy parties in New York, and the house was like a $2 million house. Uh, you know, very wealthy. And there was one paragraph that said, um, it said, the wife promises upon the effectuation of the divorce to return the diamond ring the husband's mother gave her and the Cartier watch. It's remarkable how significant the diamond ring is. I mean, the, probably one of the greatest marketing coups ever was the De Beersa family from South Africa who made this idea of having this, this compressed piece of carbon become the, the, the essence of love uh, and everything. But, but this actually comes up very, very prominently. So this was much more timely last year. Actually, I think my second Kardashian reference of the semester. 
So uh, I'll ask you just a couple of variants. So say a couple gets engaged, and then the wife breaks it off. The husband demands that the ring back. Everything happens. The wife breaks it off. She runs away with, you know, Kanye West. I don't know. <laughs> Before the marriage? Yeah, yeah, the, before the engagement, before the engagement's consummated. Well, yeah. it was <laughs> a common law rule. What's a common law rule? Well, if, she, if she's the cause of the breakup. Well, it's good. Yeah. Generally, the party that's at fault for breaking up engagement doesn't get to keep it, which is in almost all cases, though, the female. I guess men get rings also. But if the wife is a cause of the breaking of the engagement, then the husband can ask for it back. If the... Oh, I'm saying wife. Fiancé. Fiancé. The wedding, if the wedding hadn't happened yet, and if the husband is the cause of breaking up the engagement... Uh, I'm sorry. I can't speak right. If the fiancé... If, if, if the boyfriend... Oh, God. I'm getting in trouble. <laughs> if the person who gave the ring... <laughs> If the person who gave the ring is responsible for the, for, the, for the engagement being broken up, the person who received the ring If the person who received the ring is responsible for breaking up the engagement, that person has to give it back. Did I, did I say that right? <laughs> yes. Can you imagine? <laughs> can, can you imagine? But... But the easier one is after the wedding, the ring's kept permanently, right? The, the person who received the ring doesn't need to give it back because it's viewed that the wedding consummated the promise. I mean, you mentioned conditional gifts. Effectively, the diamond ring, if you want to speak in legalistic terms, is a gift on the condition of getting married, right? I'm giving you this rock on the condition that you marry me. If you don't marry me, I get the ring back. If I mess up and the wedding, and the wedding doesn't happen, you get to keep it. But once the wedding's consummated, you know, Kim and Kanye at Little Northwest, you know, at that point, they can't get the ring back. Actually, they were never married. Was there a hand up over there? No? Does that seem fair? Does anyone not like that rule? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. I'll phone you next. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, I, I, don't, I don't like it because, I mean, let's say she does something wrong. Mm -hmm. make you make you know you break all the engagement. Because I break it all because she... So she's trolling for the ring, basically. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> yes? Was your hand up? No? Yes, sir. In the back. Yeah, but the promise isn't kept. So, so you like this rule. I mean, the rule says the person who's caused the breakup has to give it back. Ah, this, this, th these cases are actually litigated, and the reason why I mentioned that, 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 that separation agreement that I was peering at my, my lawyer uh, uh, passenger was because people take this really personally. And what they stipulated in that agreement was not the common law. The common law says the wife gets to keep the ring. I'm guessing the mother of this guy was, she wants it back. Right? Well, what's, well let, let's be precise. What's the intent? Is it, I'm giving you this ring forever, or I'm giving you this ring because I want you to marry me? The latter, right? <laughs> okay, so she said, is it bailment dish? That might be more of looking at it. You can hold this so long as you get married to me. But once you marry me, you get to keep it forever. Right, right, right. Right, there's actually a lawsuit. I think that um, uh, Kardashian, what they married for, like 72 days? Yeah, and, and, and then uh, he wanted the ring back, but under the law, he's not entitled to it. Yes, in the back. Yes, yes, tell us, please. Football player for the Texans, by the way. A former, former. He was. He was drafted by them, wasn't he? Over Reggie Bush. Go ahead.
So, I mean, you'll take this in family law, but courts don't like viewing marriage as a contract. It's considered like against public policy, so I don't know how far the argument would go. Uh, but he, Williams actually got married, right? No. no. Hmm. Well, has that case been resolved yet, or is it still working? No, it's I'm curious what happened. Is it, and he's, at, he's in Buffalo now, right? I think. Okay, I, I saw I saw a hand somewhere in here. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, can you right there? Oh. Get a prenup. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's something you can specify in a prenup. And, and uh, uh, you, you can ex ante contract that. So if you're signing a prenuptial agreement, you can specify in the event of a divorce that the ring goes back to the family. Right? Uh, so it's my impression that usually the Right. Yeah. This is like I mean, uh, unless you're giving some gift for the goodness of your part, you just strings attached to it, and their conditions. Um, I'll give you an example. So, at Georgetown Law Center in Washington, there was an alum who donated like five million dollars to build a new fitness center. Right? You think it's a waste of money, but Washington is expensive. And the condition was to put his name on the on the you know, on the wall of the fitness center. He was he was actually in Texas. He was indicted and, and convicted of certain crimes. And the law school stripped his name off, but they didn't get back the money because they already spent it. And he's actually suing them now, saying that listen, my gift was contingent on you keeping my name on the wall. You need my money back. You probably need money for the reasons now. Um, but this happens, uh, and you often see this where for, you'll do this next term, where I can give a piece of land on a condition. For example, I convey uh, to, to the South Texas Law School uh, this, this piece of land so long as it's being used for a law school, right? And then say the law school turns into a medical school. Um, there's a lot of property, but what would I, the property would actually revert back to me. I would get it back. And you'll do a case, actually, I think later, later this semester, where um, these people give uh, land saying, I want this land to be used as a school. And the school turns it into like a storage facility for school supplies, right? And he actually gets it back. Yeah, I mean, when you make a promise, the intent, let's be very clear about our intent, your intent matters. Am I giving this to my daughter forever because I love her? Or am I giving to the school because I want my name on the wall, right? Or am I giving this to Kim Kardashian because I want her to, I, I don't even know why you do that. But, you know, but, but, but uh, so, so in fairness, Brittany gave the ring back because uh, I think she was at cost of breaking up. You, you might know better than I do. I, I don't really remember. Uh, but she, she did give the ring back. No. <laughs> what? Uh, two people once. What? All right, one at a time. Yes? Yeah, you can, you can under state law, you can usually all marriage in X days after the marriage. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Yeah, and I'm pretty sure that this ring was paid for by E! Entertainment Television. All right, let, let's go on to a less savory uh, relationship. So let's let's do the Newman versus Boss case. And uh, Clay, I'll call you in a second, okay? So did anyone think there's something awkward about this case? <laughs> right, we have old Mr. Boss. Um, he's actually an interesting guy. I looked up his obituary. Um, he actually fought in the Civil War. He served as the mayor of his town for like almost a decade. Um, he was very wealthy, and he ran a number of successful stores in this uh, North Carolina town. Um, his wife died fairly young, and after his wife died, this this, this lovely 18-year-old girl, um, <clears throat> uh, Julia, yes, Julia moves in with him, and uh, she lives with him alone for almost a decade, right? And uh, he wants to marry her. Uh, okay. Anyone get some weird vibes in this case? Yeah, I, I guess she, she serviced. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, the, the implications are some hanky-panky going on, to put it mildly. 
But the actual property uh, issues are, are actually kind of uh, tricky. So this case, uh, this case focuses on, you know, what was actually intended to be given, right? Okay, so Clay, let's let's walk through the facts of this case. Um, we have this kind of dramatic scene where Mr. Uh, Mr. Van Pelt is is uh, you know old and feeble. He can't really talk well. Um, and then towards the end of his life, he uh, he brings Julia, his dear uh, housekeeper, into his uh, into his uh, room, and he starts doing stuff and gesturing. What what exactly does he do when when Julia comes into the room? Okay. 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 So basically, and again, we have every reason to think that Julia's account is biased. Why? Because she stands to benefit from this, right? You, you always have these cases where these people witness these dear old dying people given almost so much property, and we always have to question it. So Julia walks in. This old guy hands her the keys. He's like. You have that, you have that, you have that. It's not really clear what he wants. But let's walk through the various items in dispute. So it was a $3,000 life insurance policy. And I apologize. The facts of this case were not written in a particularly clear way. Uh, it was a 100-year-old case. Okay? So there was a $3,000 life insurance policy. There was the household property, which was worth $200. Okay. There was the uh, the piano, which was worth three hundred dollars, and then there was the furniture in uh, Julia's room, which was forty five. Okay. So here were the main things that are given. So um, let's go down to the front room, Brian. Would these gifts have satisfied the statue of wills? Why? No, that's right. Were these gifts meant to be given during Mr. Van Pelt's life? Okay. So before, remember we said there's inter vivos and testamentary. Which one does this fall under? Testamentary. But why is this case not dismissed under the statute of wills? You're correct. The statute of wills would not be satisfied. There's no writing. What What about this case is different? No. Let, let, let's 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 stay back before. Why is this case not just dismissed because it doesn't satisfy the statute of wills? What 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 term does the court use to say that this is something different? Uh, term you might not have heard before, but it's in the reading. Was it? Yeah. Yeah, cause mortis. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Cause mortis. Okay. This is something kind of special. It's something that's kind of in decline, but it's a very narrow gift. Cause of mortis, I mean, not straight translation, but it means in anticipation of death, right? Like the death, the, the deathbed, you know, whatever. If you're on your deathbed and you know you're going to die and you don't have time to bring a lawyer to get the two signatures, all the other garbage, you can give the gift. Have you taken an evidence yet? In evidence, I'm called a dying declaration, right? You, you see this always on Law and Order. Generally speaking, you can't admit testimony from out of court unless it's been, you know, in court to testify. If a person's dead, they can't. If I'm on my deathbed and I confess, right, I give some evidence, that can be used in court. So the, the, the law has developed ways of making sure that people who are dying don't lose all their uh, wishes because they can't get to a lawyer in time. That'd be a very Terrible thing. Uh, 
I'll pause to tell a story um, uh, uh, that, that's kind of more legal ethics than anything else. So um, a friend of mine uh, knows this lawyer. And uh, this lawyer had been working for many years in Maryland. He had a very good practice. And he was doing some work for a family that just didn't have a lot of money. They just really couldn't afford much. And then the mother was on her deathbed. And she was about to die. And there wasn't much of the state, but she wanted to make sure that her kids uh, uh, got it. It was in the house. So on the phone, the lawyer and the mother discuss in terms of the will, and the lawyer draws it up. And, he, and then the wife goes, you know, come to my, um, you know, come to my hospital tomorrow. We'll sign it. As he's on his way to the hospital, the mother falls into a severe coma. She can't sign anything. And he has his document here. And the kids basically tell the lawyer, listen, my mom's not going to sign this. Let me sign this for her. I'll just, I'll just forge her signature. Because this is what she wanted. I mean, these are the exact terms. She told you on the phone yesterday. There's no surprises. This is what my mom told you. And let me sign it. Because if we don't sign this, my mom will die without a will. We have to go through intestacy, which is a very complicated process. There's probing. There's a lot of things that can get taken away. And there wasn't enough of an estate. Effectively, the kid said, if this goes through probate, there won't be anything left. We'll just sell the house that we want to keep because the various fees. So you, you will all be lawyers in about two years. How many of you would, would uh, let, let the son sign the document? <laughs> really? OK, how many would not? So there's, there's, there's an old rule that lawyers say is a lawyer always goes home at night, right? The lawyer never goes to jail. So here's what happens in the aftermath. The lawyer says, okay, I'll, I'll let you sign it. Okay, document signed. It looks good. The mother passes away, you know, the next day. Shortly thereafter, the kids, there were a couple sons, they start fighting. One of the sons was living in the house, and he wouldn't let the other sons in. And the other son brings a suit based on this will saying, hey, listen, we're supposed to share this house equitably. What do you think the jerk son does? He says the will's not valid because it was forged. Right. The jerk son says this will's not valid because it's forged. The will's invalidated. The estate goes through probate. Exactly what they didn't want to happen. What do you think happens to the lawyer? Disbarred. Not jail, but disbarred. He loses the law license. He suborned perjury. He, he knowingly made a fraud on the court. He knew this person was forging his signature. Yeah, so lawyer always goes home at night, right? Don't risk your law license for these kinds of things. I'm sorry, what was your question? No, 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 no. You can't be stupid. Well, I mean, yeah, but but you you all have an obligation, right? You're all lawyers. You're members of a bar. You have an obligation to self-regulate. No one's watching your day-to-day -day activities. These are the kind of things you should keep in the back of your mind because these are the challenges you're going to have. And I, I, I admire your intentions. You absolutely did the right thing, but you're going to lose your profession. <laughs> Shrug. I mean, but but you lose your job, you lose your license. I mean, you lose your family as well. You know, uh, income. So these are these are these are tough questions that you face, and you'll. I'm sure lawyers break this up all the time, but uh, this guy got caught because the jerk son who asked him to sign in the first place then went back and said the law that the thing wasn't valid to his forge. None. That that's so true. See, the problem is this gift cause of mortis has been in kind of decline. Courts don't want to enforce it. And even if they had said it, there was an actual instrument. In other words, the mother didn't say this on her deathbed, right? The mother didn't say this on her deathbed. She spoke of this on the phone the day before when she was not near death. She, she took a sudden decline and she went to a coma like the next day. Okay? So um, we have these various issues, okay? So the life insurance policy, if I can scroll back up. Uh, Genesis, where was the life insurance policy stored? Where, where was it kept? Let the gas be louder, please. Right, and was that drawer locked? And would that key 
given to Julia have unlocked the drawer. Okay. So, let's just imagine this, right? This guy is really wealthy. He's been with this lady for a decade, right? He gives her keys. What do you think his intent was? To that include the life insurance policy. Okay. Who here thinks that he really just wants to give his dear old friend this heavy old wooden wardrobe? Anyone? Who here thinks he was trying to give her the, the life insurance policy inside? Right. Everyone knew what was going on here. But why, Melissa, why does the court not rule this way? Why is the court so strict on what's actually being given by handing over the keys? Right. Right. This isn't a case where he has to drop a 6,000-pound left, left to center. He could have said, hey, go take these keys, open the drawer, and hand me this piece of paper. And they could have given it to her. Right? That would have taken one minute. He could have even just taken the keys and pointed at the drawer, and I'm sure she knew what was in there. She could have figured it out. But she didn't do that. So the court here construes symbolic delivery very narrowly. Very narrowly. It's like, yeah, I'm giving you these keys so you can open up this wooden wardrobe. That's it. All right? Um, the court distinguishes some other cases, like this, this Thomas versus Lewis case in Virginia. Um, and in this case, there actually was a delivery of the stuff inside the drawer. He actually did transfer it. And, and I think what the court says, and this is not necessarily good law anymore, this is a hundred and something year old case, but where the articles are capable of manual delivery, right, where the articles can be delivered manually, they should be. George, why, why is this a rule the court wants to adopt? Why is such a strict rule? Easy. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, possession, you know, obviously if you gave it to her and it's able to be given to her, then they don't have to go through the whole process of trying to figure out she's lying. They actually yeah. understand his intent. They actually know the face plot she had in this, what would actually happen. Right. And she accepted it. Right, it's easy. I mean, and, and let, let's be cynical for a moment. This is a 28-year-old woman who's been living with an 80-year-old for a decade. There's probably some hanky-panky going on. She's not exactly the most credible witness, right? She has a serious intent in portraying the facts in the light most favorable to her. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, I don't know, this is North Carolina in the, uh, the 1800s. I'm guessing uh, that child would have been uh, uh, considered illegitimate. Um, and, and actually, into well into the 20th century, many states placed disabilities on illegitimate children. They couldn't inherit property. Uh, they, if they weren't recognized by the father, they couldn't inherit anything. So this uh, such a child would have been in, uh, would have been in tough shape. Uh, the Supreme Court actually subsequently ruled that most qu uh, classifications based on legitimacy are not, are not valid in most cases. Any questions about that? Did he say that? That would have been a closer call. I mean, he wasn't exactly communicating well. He was dying. He couldn't really talk much. And in his mind, he probably did the best he could. But if, he, if on his deathbed he said, Julia, sweetheart, I want you to take that life insurance policy and, and have a wonderful life. I want you to have everything in this house, every last article. The court would probably gone the other way, I think. Yes, ma'am. If the facts were as she said, the case for the, for the constructive or symbolic delivery would be much stronger. If the court wants to stick with the physical delivery, that's tough. Why is it tough? Because I want to give you everything in this house, right? It would be physically impossible for her, under her facts, to get every single item in the house. And even, you know, insurance policy, whatever. So if you make this broad thing, it's actually called a, uh, I'm doing this in the afternoon, called a Mother Hubbard clause. Everyone know that nursery around my old Mother Hubbard? It refers to everything. Okay? Yes, ma'am.
Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think that's right. The court mentions for, at least under North Carolina law, the 1800s, one witness required for the cause of mortis. Um, and I think the, the housekeeper, Houston, was there also, so I guess she could have been the witness. So it, it would satisfy the gift of cause of mortis, but would not satisfy the statute of wills because he's two independent witnesses. And, and to be precise, there's nothing in writing also. Uh, is there a hand up over there? Yes? No, you? You? Go ahead. Why exactly did they not just because they want to go with this, this doctrine here? This is not made up. This is a legitimate doctrine. This is gift cause of mortis. This was a thing. And they existed simultaneously. Yes. Okay, so they just chose. Yeah, I mean, the statute of wills is usually what happened. I mean, I, I think it's fairly rare that people make these conveyances on the deathbed. Hopefully, people at the time they're, they're of age, they have some sort of, uh, um, you know, will. But, but these laws exist for the purpose of people who don't and want to try and get rid of it on the deathbed. So these exist concurrently. Um, I don't think you'll see give cause of mortis too much anymore. I think it's, it's somewhat in decline for the exact reason that the California, I'm sorry, the New York case cites the next one, because it's so easy to not have enough evidence to see if it's fraud or not. Yes, sir. In the case of cause of mortis, if something miraculously happens, you can still take back your gift. Oh, that's a good question. So you make this this confession cause mortis, and then you have this miraculous recovery. Uh, I I'd have to check North Carolina law. But I'm guessing yeah, um, because the next day you can then execute a will, which would nullify the the, the deathbed confessional. This actually comes up in evidence where um, well I can't remember how it goes in evidence, but it actually happens where someone's making a deathbed confessional. And they miraculously survive, and they try and exclude the statement as hearsay. They try and exclude their own statement. I, I can't remember how that comes out, but you will say that in evidence. Yeah, I, th I think the book only says one witness. And to be, I, I'm not, I'm not sure the, the the exact requirements, but it's not really a modern doctrine. It doesn't come up too much anymore. I don't think the, I don't think the the the, the has to be in writing. Um, because generally, by the very nature of a deathbed confessional, you're not writing stuff down, right? You're just kind of talking or pointing. If the person uh, dies, and eventually, I guess, dies, has a court. Right. Ah. But it also has a will. Which, which trumps. You'll say you'll say you'll say this in wills and trusts. Um, I suspect the later in time will trump. But you can imagine serious conflicts between a will, and then on his deathbed, they leave everything to his, uh, his nice girlfriend. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure the answer. I'm guessing there will be a serious conflict in the later which might trump if it's, if it's, if it's done valid. But that's, yeah, I mean, well, it's not really hearsay, but it, it's, you're, you're admitting evidence of a dead person. And that's why we have all these formalities to make sure that, they're, that their wishes are honored, because they can't come back to haunt us and tell us if we're doing right or wrong. Your questions on this. All right, let's. Everyone get this case, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, basically, the court here construed the symbolic delivery doctrine very narrowly, right? They said if something can be manually delivered, it should. All he had to do was say, "Give me that piece of paper," and handed it back to her. He was too bad the life insurance policy. Okay, and poor Miss Julia, after toiling for ten years with this old dude, she gets a piano, maybe. <laughs> She, she can play the little violin, too. Oh, sorry. All right, let's do the Gruen case. So whenever you see a case where it's like the same name versus the same name, it's almost always some sort of family divorce case. Because usually it's husband suing wife or child suing great mother-in-law or whatever it is. Okay. I actually have a picture. Does anyone know or care who Klimt is? Good. Oh, this is actually the house from the, um, the Van Pelt house. This is actually his tomb, I think. That is. The internet has everything. Um, this is the uh, the Klimt painting. Okay, isn't it is it is it nice? You like it? What? I don't I don't know art. Um, oh, actually, did we? No, we no other class in front. Uh, so let's let's do the facts of here. So, um, Anthony, can you run me through uh, the facts uh, of how it happened in this case? <laughs> right. 
little bit louder, please. When? Right, okay, so first, dad writes to his son, son, you know, I love you so much. When I die, I want you to have this really expensive painting. But Anthony, what happens while while the father's still alive? Right. <laughs> well, more than revoking, what does he ask his son to do with the first letter? Destroy it. And and on what advice does he tell his son to do this? <laughs> oh, some terrible lawyer, right? So he's it's like, son, I want you to have this painting when I die. Oh, never mind, son. Uh, my lawyer says that would be bad. So instead, how, how, what does he say in the second letter, Anthony? Um, that it shouldn't be a gift. It uh-huh. When, where would the painting reside during the rest of the father's life? With, with the father, right? When would the son actually have it? Okay, good. So the setup is, hey, son, I'm giving you a present, but you can't have it while I'm dead. Is that, is that a good summary? Right? So, Raymond, based on what we said before, would this be an inter vivos gift or testamentary? Ba based on just what we said before. When would he actually get the painting? Mm. Okay, so let's do a show of hands. Who here thinks this is an inter vivos gift? Okay. Putting aside the court's holding, just based on what we studied, okay? Who here thinks it's a testamentary gift? Okay, it's actually split pretty evenly. So this is a, this is a kind of a tricky case. Um, uh, by the way, the case came about because it's always the evil stepmother if you think about the painting. It's always, always evil stepmother. So, the, the, what did the trial court then say, uh, Jeremy? Did the trial court think it was a testamentary gift or inter vivos? No, no, the trial court, starting from the below. Yes, right, so the trial court said it was testamentary. Um, and I think that that holding is somewhat intuitive, right? This is no different than the case of the ring. Remember the mother said, hey, sweetie, you can have this ring when I die. Right? We did that you know, 20 minutes ago. And, and whoever said it said, no, that's a testamentary gift because it goes into effect after I die. But the court of... I always spelled this word wrong. I'm sorry. Test, tata, entry. And so then the court of appeals... That's actually called the appellate division. Um, I think I mentioned this before, but in New York, the highest court... The Court of Last Resort is called the New York Court of Appeals. The trial court is called the New York Supreme Court. Okay? It's backwards what you think. The reason why is because was, they were called the Supreme Court because they had supreme jurisdiction, that general jurisdiction over all claims. Maryland's the same, the highest court is called the Court of Appeals. So a New York Intermediate Court is called the Appellate Division. Okay? And actually, the trial court is going to be precise called the Supreme Court. So it will come in handy never. So the Appellate Division said that a valid gift may be made by reserving a life estate. Now I'm going to give you a preview now, a horrible, gru grueling preview of what you've been studying life in a week. When I give a piece of property, I'm giving a bundle of sticks, right? Remember I had those, I don't have to say, but I had those bundles of sticks. I might say, you know, I'm giving you this property, but in 10 years, I get to get it back. Or, I'm giving you this piece of property, but when you die, I get it back. Or, I'm giving you this property so long as it's used as a school, but if it's not used as a school anymore, I get it back. We talk about it, conditional gifts. Same with the ring. I give you this ring so long as we get married. If we don't get married because of you, I get the ring back. In property, there's something called a life estate. It's actually one of the easier ones, which is why I'm glad it's mentioned here. A life estate is exactly what it sounds like. It's giving someone something for their life, for the duration of the life. If 
if I say, you know, um, Anthony, I want to give you this property for your life, right? That means as long as you're alive, you get to keep it, and then once you die, it comes back to me. So we'll get that, that that's simple enough. I own all the other sticks in the bundle. The only stick that Anthony gets is a stick that lets him keep it during his life. Can we get that? Then we wouldn't transfer a title just to transfer possession. Uh, don't get bogged down in what title means. We'll do that later for that property too. But think of it in terms of sticks. It's a lot easier for now. Okay. If you want to be precise, the title will say life estate. I mean, that's what it'll say. So that's effectively the stick. So what happened here was something similar, right? Did the father, the father originally owned it. He had all the bundles, he had the entire bundle of sticks, right? Uh, Alex? Oh, Matt, I'm sorry. I'm on roll. Matt, what did, what did the father give the son in terms of the bundle of sticks? Which stick did you give him? Well, I was kind of really interested in giving him all right Except for, except for, what's it called? Yes. Yes. What the father did was he gave his son the entire bundle of sticks, save for one. He gave himself a life estate. So let's let's put this in terms of something that you might be able to understand a little bit better. Let's put this in terms of something you might understand a little bit better. Imagine you have a, a father who's old, right? And the father is late in life, and he owns a piece of property. And he says, son, I want you to have this property when I die, but I want to live here for the rest of my natural life. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you this property minus a life estate for me. Let's say that again. I'm going to re reserve a life estate for myself so I can live on it throughout my life, and then when I die, you get the rest of it. This is actually fairly common because it's a way of giving property without going through probate. Saying, as soon as I die, this automatically goes back to you. Um, the re <laughs> uh, I, we do this case, I think, next semester. Um, but uh, 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 Chris, why why wouldn't dear old dad just give us some life uh, the entire thing right away? Why would he bother reserving the life estate himself? What's he afraid of? Was that? Right. Once you give someone all of your property, you're out of luck. Son might kick gear off dad off the farm. So by reserving a life estate for himself, he preserves himself. So let's go back to this painting case. If the father had given the son the entire painting, the entire bundle of sticks at his 21st birthday, what could the son have demanded at that time? The son could have demanded the possession of the entire painting. I mean, you can't really chop up the pieces. He would demand the painting. Did the father want to give up the entire painting when he's 21? So, so Ashley, how did the father then structure this transaction on the advice of his, of his attorney? But be very precise. What, what interest did he give to his son? When? At what point would the son get ownership? Yes. The father gave the son 100% ownership when he dies. Okay? So I, I can write like this. So, you know, while the father is alive, the son has what we call a future interest. You're going to hate this word in a few weeks. If you read ahead, you know why. The son has a future interest. The interest doesn't really mean anything now, right? I mean, you can't chop a painting up into pieces. The son can't take it from the father's uh, library. That'd be, that'd be conversion. So this, the, the, while the father's alive, the son's a future interest. When the father dies, the future interest becomes a possessory interest. This is a good preview of the next topic. It's not enough to think about who owns something now. Property is all about who owns it in the future. 
or when some condition happens. That's what makes this class so annoying. <laughs> there are always various things about why property might change. So the father did here was actually pretty crafty, and the court actually ruled in his favor, which was not a given because the other courts didn't. But what the father effectively did was he said, listen, son, I'm giving you a future interest today. When I die, that future interest becomes possessory. You will own this painting when I die. So it's not a testamentary gift. It is inter vivos, right? Um, Haley, so if this is an inter vivos gift, what exactly did the father give the son on his 25th birthday? It's a good stuff question. But what exactly did the father give it? It's on the board too. What did the father give the son on his 25th birthday? What do we call it? Yes, future interest. What the father gave on the 21st birthday was a future interest, saying, I'm giving you this interest that will become possessory or become fulfilled when I die. <laughs> you can imagine another case where a father gives um, certain stocks and bonds, right, to the son. It's just paper. There's no significance. But when the son actually sells it, those things become worth something. There are lots of gifts you give someone that the time of the transaction doesn't really matter. They only become worthwhile later in life. Right. What, what that would be is a father would be preserving a life estate for himself. The father saying, listen, I'm giving you this future interest, but in the meantime, I'm going to keep it for myself. Yeah, we're going to spend like six weeks on this topic, so if you're confused, don't be. I'm trying to keep it as simple as I can. Yes, ma'am? Uh, kind of, yes. So what's interesting, though, is after the father makes his conveyance, right, can he back out of it? Well, go back to the beginning of the class. Go back to the first few minutes of the class. What intent? What was the father's intent when he wrote this letter? When? Okay. After this conveyance is done, who holds that interest? Who holds the right to it at the father's death? The son. Can the father take it away? I'm asking you. How can how could the father take it away? Who who holds that right? It's the son. So can the father take something back the son has? That's right. Everyone see that? The second the father wrote that letter and he gave the future interest to his son, the son had the future interest. Think of it in terms of the bundles of sticks. The father gave the son a stick in that bundle. Can the father take that stick back? No. Because the son has it. Yeah, the son took it. Yeah. Yeah, then that would have been fine, but, but there was evidence in the record that the son actually accepted it, and the son acknowledged it. He didn't mention it in his divorce proceedings, which is interesting, but not, not really germane. So I think the act of burning the letter signifies the son revoked whatever was initially given. So it was the second letter, the one that was approved by his lawyer, in which the interest was given. In this case, if you promise to do something, you're saying that because you promise to do something, you can't do it. You are a last message. If I promise you to do it, you can't do it. So, what was the first thing you learned in contracts that the UCC? Does it apply to property? No. We're not in UCC land, my friends. We are in property land. We have totally different rules. Um, you'll see a lot of property, too, um, a movement to try to incorporate contract doctrine into the property law. So we don't have that. We are in our <coughs> own feudalism times. Kind of like medieval times, but older. Yes? So that way, there's not to probate. Probate extension and time to but I'll give you a historical point. Wills are fairly recent innovations. Those didn't exist in medieval times. 
the way people did direct the property during medieval times was through these kinds of grants. This is like 800 years old. This is old stuff long before wheels. That's a circle, that's why. Yes, sir. Uh, your father has a black state president. Yes. You can transfer that. Yes, you can. Then, so he, if the father transfers his black state yep. to say his wife, uh -huh. he dies, it, it revokes back to his son, correct? Yes. You'll say that in a couple weeks. But the only interest at this point the father has is the life estate in his painting. Right? That's the only stick he has. Even if he gives a stick to his wife and then lives for another 50 years, his stick only lasts his lifetime. It's time to his life. You can't give more than what you have. That's why I keep thinking of the sticks. The stick says, I have this painting as long as I'm alive. I can give it to someone else. Now, we'll say this later, but people usually don't like buying life estates. Why? Because if someone else dies, they lose it. No one wants to buy property from someone who's going to die and they, they, they lose it. Questions? We'll study this a lot more. This wasn't even uh, uh, that important of an aspect of this case, but, but it's a good opportunity to introduce it without too much uh, uh, doctrine. Yes, sir. What do you expect They were trying to go around the inheritance tax. Because if this was a gift that would be testamentary, that would go through the will, there's a significant tax you have to pay. Um, and this painting is worth a, like a million dollars, whatever. So lawyers try to find ways of giving property to their, not lawyers, but lawyers help clients give property to their kids that paying the inheritance tax. They have trusts and other stuff. We'll do this later property, too. But this is a way to get around taxes. Um, it's funny, you'll say this. Most property law has been invented as ways to get around taxes. Um, feudal taxes were invented, and that's why we have all these other conveyances. Uh, because basically during medieval times, the king would tax property that was descended upon death. So they invented these crazy words so that property was actually descended upon death. They started taxing that, and they found other ways. So we've been like in an 800-year-long struggle to like you know uh, not pay taxes like the, 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 the primogenitor tea party uh, back in the day. Okay, so let's let's actually just break down this case then. We have the three interests. We have the intent, we have the delivery, and we have the acceptance, right? Uh, is, that the, is that Natalia? Mm -hmm. So uh, tell me, was there intent? What was the intent in this case from the father? Be precise. What was he giving to the son? And what do we call that? So you can look back in your notes. No? Yes. So the intent was a father gave a future interest, and we say he preserved a life estate. Okay. Uh, uh, Natalia, was there was there delivery? What 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 would we call the letter? What kind of delivery is that? Yes, we had symbolic delivery with the letter. Um, now the North Carolina court. I'm sure would say, well, it's a painting. It's not that big. You can transfer it. But modern courts will say, okay, that's symbolic. That's fine. Okay. And was there acceptance by the son? Yeah. So was there a valid gift? According to the court? Yes. Yeah. So the court said there's a valid intervivos gift. It's not testamentary. Um, this this holding is kind of weird. I mean, it, it, it's it's somewhat counter. But if you want to be very precise with how the painting was done, and there was a lawyer behind this. Um, this is how it was done. There actually was something given. It was the future interest being given. He wasn't actually giving the physical painting. He was giving an interest in the painting. It was like one of the sticks in the mud. Um, and just as an after after note, the son sold it on auction for five point three million dollars, and then ten years later, the the the, the painting sold at auction for twenty three million dollars. Should have kept it. Oh, whatever. All right. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. By, by the act of burning it, I think the son effectively reneged and revoked whatever acceptance he might have. It's kind of, it's kind of shady because lawyers will really burn letters, but uh, whatever. Any questions? Anything? All right, I'll see you all on Thursday. Have a good night.